Angel is brought to you by LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash angel and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And Salesforce Essentials. Jumpstart sales and support by leveraging the world's number one CRM at a startup price point at just $25 a month per user. Go to salesforce.com slash angel for an additional 50% off and a free onboarding call. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Angel, the podcast. This is season three of the podcast that I paired with my book, Angel. If you haven't read the book, go ahead and buy it on Amazon or Audible or Barnes Voice for the 6% of you that do. Go ahead and buy the Audible book because, hey, I read it myself. And there are many theories about how to invest in startup companies. There is no one unifying theory of investing. And that is why it's such a great sport. It's such a great endeavor is because everybody who comes to it has their own idea of which founders are going to succeed in which markets. And there's a ton of randomness, but there are some heuristics. And what we like to do here on this podcast is talk to the most successful investors currently investing in Silicon Valley here in the cradle of innovation. And I'm super excited today that my friend Mamoon Hamid, and it's Hamid, right? People say Hamid or Hamid. They say Hamid. It's Hamid. It's Hamid. Yeah. It's Hamid. Uh, and uh, it's Ramadan when we're taping this. So you're a little bit weak. You're fasting. I am. And if I slur my speech, it's because <laughs> I'm not as sharp as usual. But you get to eat when the sun goes down. Yeah, which is about six hours from now. So it's a 12-hour fast. It's actually more like uh, 14? 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. So oh, okay. So that's more intense. That's 16, 16 hours. 16 yeah, I've hour. been doing the 13-hour circadian rhythm fast. I lost 15 pounds on it. You start at sundown, yeah. and then you, you can eat breakfast the next day. You look great. Yeah. It's, Thanks. Yeah. And you have a little ways to go, but- Yeah, I do the no breakfast fast, which is pretty awesome too. Yeah. Yeah. You feel more mentally clear when you lower your caloric intake? As well as uh, less distractions. Hmm. Like food is distraction. It takes so much time. When you cut out one meal a day, yeah. you get back like an hour. Oh, totally. Plus the hour after when you're digesting. Oh, totally. So it's really like a gain of two hours, and you're only awake and productive for maybe 12 hours a day anyway, 14 hours a day. So, so you look better, you feel better. You're smarter, you're crisper. I think yeah. it's also for older folks, and when you pass 40, I think they say lower caloric is better for a life extension. So I think that seems to me direct to be directionally correct. Yeah, if we, you're in, if you're an engine and you burn less calories, you burn the engine less. It's like driving we, your car less. We eat too much. I mean, uh, just if you look at our ancestors historically, like, you know, we didn't consume three thousand calories a day, and it's we bonkers. worked a lot more. We weren't in sedentary lifestyle, sitting behind desks or in meeting rooms. Yeah. Well, now we have standing desks, so that solves everything. <laughs> yeah. And I love how people are like, oh, you have standing desks, so <laughs> treadmill desks, you're good. Treadmill desks make sense to me, but I'm not sure standing makes all that much of a difference. I mean, it might be more comfortable, but- I haven't gotten into that one yet. Yeah. Um, so by way of introduction, Mamoon, uh, if my memory serves me co correct, and I, I don't want to embarrass you, but Yammer, Box, and Slack, and Front App? Am I right that you were the partner on all of those? I know you worked on teams, but you were on the board and or the partner who made those investment decisions? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty heck of a track record. Well, uh, I've been doing this for almost 15 years. So, yeah. How did you get started? What was your first gig in venture? Uh, my first gig in venture was actually a summer internship uh, when I was in business school in summer of 2004. For Stanford or Harvard? Harvard. You went to Harvard Business School? Harvard. You couldn't get into Stanford? I didn't apply to Stanford. That's my standard joke. Oh, you totally, you handled it well. Usually when I say to a Harvard person they didn't get to Stanford, they explain to me that Harvard's the better school. Yeah, I know. Well, I'd gone to grad school for Stanford, to Stanford, so I'd done my master's at Stanford, so huh. I just thought it'd be a little- In what? Uh, in uh, management science and engineering. Management science and engineering. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination of like eight different degrees at Stanford. Uh, from the 90s, and it became this thing called MSNE, which everybody knows about now. But I was the first class of MSNE. Hmm. Uh, but I started out actually in electrical engineering at Stanford for my master's because that was what I did my undergrad in. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, you know, my parents, immigrant parents, expected you, me to do a PhD in in electrical or engineering or something or the other. Yeah. And uh, so I went to go 
get my master's mm-hmm. with the hope maybe I'd get a PhD one day. But yet you didn't and you just totally disappointed them. Totally. Uh, my Actually, my dad just even a few years ago said to me, you know, it's not too late to get a, a JD. Yeah. I'm like, JD? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm one of the top 25 venture capitalists yeah. in the world. Why do I need that? Yeah. But it's it's pretty funny. Are you uh, what nationality? I don't even know. I'm uh, Pakistani. You're but Pakistani, I, but okay. I grew up in Germany. So from wow. effectively zero to ten, Germany. Yeah. Ten to thirteen in Pakistan. Thirteen to sixteen back in Germany. There is a major educational and aspirational push uh, from those uh, groups. Yeah, growing up Pakistani, the educational yeah. push is hard. Yeah, especially I mean, for the immigrant. Totally. I mean, we were like in the 70s and 80s when I grew yeah. up in Germany, not a lot of people that look like me. Yeah, that must right? have been very interesting. Yeah, it's a good, great place to have grown up. Nevertheless, not a lot of people look like yeah. me. So, you know, our parents, my parents, yeah, education was pretty, we were pushed. Uh, you, you listen to Preet Bahar's podcast at all? The, I have not, but I hear it's, it's great. amazing. Yeah. yeah, stay tuned with Preet, it's great. And then he's also got a paid one at cafe.com called Cafe Insider. But anyway, his book came out and it was number four on the bestseller list. So he says to his dad, Hey, Dad, I'm on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm number four. And his dad says, oh, so there's room to improve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty great. Yeah. Uh, so now you're a Kleiner. And before that, you were working with my friend Chamath and my other friend Ted yeah. at Social Capital. And then before that, you had an internship somewhere? Oh, no. Uh, so I had six years of Social Capital and six years before of U.S. Venture Partners. That's where I started my VC ah, career. Ah, U.S. Venture Partners. Yeah. That's where Ted worked. That's where Ted and I worked. That's where ah. we got to know each other. In your, what are you, like in your 20s when you guys worked there? Late uh, 20s? Early I joined 30s? when I was 27. So I'm 41. So uh, yeah, I right out of business school in 2005. Wow. I went so to So you're USVP. part of that group of people. Yeah. The It used to be the old trajectory to be a venture capitalist was to go to business school and then your first job out of school would be in venture capital. Yeah. Well, I I had worked for six years for a company before that, before uh, I went to business school. So I'd been an engineer. Got it. Worked for six, well, three years as an engineer, three years as a product slash marketing guy. What type of company? Uh, it was a company called Xilinx, uh, oh. semiconductor company. Ah. Worth like $30 billion still today. Kleiner Perkins led the Series A. Got it. So you like, did get some experience working at a tech company. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I don't think I would have been qualified to do anything in venture capital had I not worked inside of a tech company. Right. And but you didn't work at startups. I did not. The, the company at the time was about 1,000 employees. Yeah. So it was not a startup. Now, yeah. people seem to be hiring not from the ranks of the big companies or the Harvard or Stanford's, but going into the companies and looking for the growth engineers and the founders. That seems to be the more likely career path, right? I think their venture capitalists come in all shapes and sizes. And uh, you know, if you look at the last few people we've hired to our team, uh, every single one of them has an operating background. So mm. having worked inside of a company that's seen some scale, uh, one of my colleagues uh, joined from Uber. Uh, she was at Bain before that. Another I heard that's co- a good company. Yeah. yeah. It's done okay. Congratulations. Oh, well, we'll find out on Friday. Yeah, you'll be fine. I think I'll be okay. You'll be okay. Yeah, people are like, "Are you nervous?" I'm like, "I invested <laughs> when the company was five million. If it if it goes out at five billion, you realize I've done okay. Like, that's a thousand x. That would be like the thousand x. Yeah, I think I'm okay with it being at fifty. Yeah, or twenty five, or anything in between. Who cares? So we're so win. We're, we're all lucky. Yeah, absolutely. Born in this country at this time, or got to this country totally. at this time, <laughs> is the gift. Is the gift. We were telling yeah. our kids last night that your biggest gift is that you're born to this family in this time. So yeah. we count our blessings. Well, if you think about it in terms of wealth creation, in terms of safety, security, yeah, being born in this age, in the developed world, you've eliminated starvation, murder, hopefully, and a lot of other, and just having access to education. Yeah. Just, you know, even from stillbirth to birth defects to all yeah. kinds of things that would happen. Like, you know, you hear about your grandparents who had three other kids that didn't, didn't make it. That didn't make it. You didn't know yeah, they about They died in childbirth. Yeah. They died shortly. They died when they were two or one. Oh, totally. Yeah. Devastating, right? Like I have a one and a half year old. Like, Can you imagine? The, the notion of just that is just crazy. And it was common. It was totally common. Yeah. I found out later in life that my 
my mom and my uncles and aunts, they had a seventh sibling. Yeah. And we never knew. Yeah. Because you didn't talk about it. It was just too painful to bring up. And that was totally. every family, I guess. Every family. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. So we live in a pretty special time. We don't yeah. think of it because we don't have the context of history. Right. Or the past. We're so entitled. We are so entitled. It's crazy. Like, I, I was having this conversation with my wife, and I was like, wow, you know, like, any existential angst we have, any anxiety we have, we should really just punch ourselves in the face and just be like, get a grip, because we didn't have to live through a war. We didn't have to fight in a war. Yeah. We didn't have to be scared of being drafted. None of this stuff. Yeah. And we complain about our food arriving late to our f doorstep. I was outraged today. I ordered Uber Eats and my Impossible Burger. I very specifically ordered lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, and avocado, and it came plain. Well, the, I think the problem is- The you, rage I felt. The problem is that you ordered an Impossible Burger. You should have had a Beyond Meat Burger. Oh, is that the problem? <laughs> Your investors in Beyond? <laughs> I'm happy. Do you think all that stuff is going to work? Is that going to uh, be able to be as affordable as meat? Because factory farming is super cheap. But my understanding yeah. is that some of these mock meats or imitation meats or replacement meats are more expensive right now. They're actually not. If you uh, So it hit me about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, my next door neighbor, Leo, I think Leo's between 75 and 80, uh, very kind man. He comes to our house and drops off a box of Beyond Meat burgers. He's like, hey, these are the best thing. You need to have these. And it's like, where'd you get these? Like, I think our, my firm's an investor in this thing. It's like, oh, Safeway. I, I eat them like every week. And so so that just to me is like, holy cow. Like, Wow, it made it. Leo is buying these at Safeway and having them multiple times a week. A week. And he's not a vegetarian, but he just likes the taste of the burger. So and the, didn't one of them go to Burger King now? Is it Impossible or Beyond? Impossible is, is a it Burger, a Burger King. King. Yeah. That seems to be the tipping point to me. If that flies, yes. that's, that's the game changer right there. Well, it, for the longest time, these things were not scalable. Like the, you know, there's pretty big differences between Beyond Meat, Beyond Meat and uh, Impossible Burger taste. You know, there's one has heme and the other's pea based. And, yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, like they figured out how to make this cheap. Like mm. make it so that it's actually viable at Safeway, um, but there. Uh, I think the macro suggests that the amount of water that's used, land that's used to make beef, mm. beef burgers, is is like y you've seen all the charts and yeah. that show like it is not sustainable. No, and so we need a better solution. And when this thing, uh, this Beyond Meat burger, or this Impossible burger, tastes really good, and it's eighty percent, eighty percent, right? What yeah. do you feel? If you had to put a percentage, if you were just, if we weren't on camera right now, you didn't have Beyond Meat. By the way, they did, had a credible IPO. They're worth almost four and a half billion dollars. It's incredible. Incredible. And that bet, whoever made that bet probably looked really stupid for two or three years. Oh, it was an And they probably look brilliant now. We just actually did a debrief on it because we were the Series A investor at Kleiner. You were the Series A? Yes. Oh, that takes conviction. Oh, I mean, I wasn't, but the, the yeah. team that, that made the bet, uh, and we were going through just the ups and downs of that company yesterday as a debrief of like, hey, successful IPO, but you know, we, uh, the folks in the room, John Doerr and Brooke Byers and Touch Line, who were just reminding us like, hey guys, like this thing went through ups and downs and, mm. and uh, you know, we didn't think it would make it. Ethan, the founder, didn't think it would make it. Wow. So, but, but nevertheless, uh, it's now public, went public last week. It's awesome. It's amazing. Uh, but m maybe more to talk about the macro trend there. It was about, we we talked about land and water use for making beef, but the thesis was like, hey, we need to find a better solution to this. So let's go find uh, a protein, a plant-based protein uh, that is manufacturable. And that's what the Series A bet was. Actually, it was one of our uh, partners, uh, Amol Deshpande, who now runs a company called Farmers Business Network. And he actually came from uh, from the ag world, from Cargill. So wow. he had a thesis around like, you know, plant-based food and just that we're going to run out of food if we keep going in the current uh, trajectory. And so that's that was a thesis, Series A thesis behind investing in. Uh, yeah, I had him on the podcast back in the day, and I thought it was super interesting. What percentage do you think it's there to for somebody who's a meat lover? For a meat lover, what do you think it is on a percentage basis? I'd say what you said, about 80%. You think, yeah. Yeah, I think if you're a, a vegetarian, you love it. Like uh, someone was telling me- Oh, for sure. Uh, they went to some some you know weekend away somewhere and they lived off of like Beyond Meat burgers because they're vegetarian. They, c they couldn't live life without like Beyond Meat anymore. 
and that's pretty amazing. But I think as a meat eater, I, I'm a you know I have high, I have high LDL, so shouldn't be eating as much meat. But uh, I'd say it's about eighty to ninety percent. I mean, I love Shake Shack in and out. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, but every once in a while, Impossible Beyond Meat, eighty percent. Yeah, I th- I think that's what I'm going to do. Is I'm going to go fifty fifty. Yeah, it seems reasonable to me. Uh, for those of you wondering, episode six eighty, which I think was back in two thousand thirteen, uh, Farmers Business Network co-founder Amal was on the pod. Um, wow. Yeah, that's crazy. We got to pull that. Uh, 2016. Yeah, we got to definitely do a uh, podcast about that. All right. When we get back from this quick break, I want to understand how you had the conviction, speaking of conviction, to do Slack. Because that, to me, sounded like the silliest, stupidest, unfundable idea, a chat room, when IRC is free, you guys decide to make a bet on it, and it becomes, let's face it, I think, in the top four or five companies of this last cohort of unicorns here in Silicon Valley when we get back on Angel Podcast. Hiring is so hard. It is probably the hardest thing you're going to do aside from raising money. And you know what? A lot of the people I know who raise money, they have a harder time finding team members. It's arduous. It's hard out there. We have incredibly low unemployment and there's a massive, massive competition for great talent. But luckily, There is LinkedIn Jobs with more than 500 million active members. People come to LinkedIn every day to make connections, to grow their careers, and to discover new job opportunities. 90% of LinkedIn users are open to new opportunities, but they're not actively looking on job boards. You know these people, you're probably one of them. So LinkedIn Jobs gives you access to an entirely different demographic that doesn't exist anywhere else. We call those passive job seekers. They might not be looking for a job, but they would consider a new gig if it was better. And we found director Sir Charles and our marketing manager, Maureen, on LinkedIn. You need LinkedIn jobs to find the right people for your business, and you will get targeted job promotion, recommended matches, and candidate management through a dashboard that tracks everyone from application all the way to hire all in one place, so you're not going to lose valuable candidates. LinkedIn Jobs uses knowledge of both hard skills, like cloud computing, social media marketing, video production, whatever it is, and soft skills, like collaboration and time management. And they do that to match people who fit your role best in your company. So here is your call to action. Post a job today at linkedin.com slash angel, A-N-G-E-L, and get $50 off your first job post. And that's right, a 50, a 50 from JCal and your friends at LinkedIn by going to linkedin.com slash angel. It's that simple. Terms and conditions, of course, apply. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Angel the Podcast. My guest today, Mamoon Hamid, or Hamid, Hamid. Or Hamid. Hamid. Yeah. Hamid. Got it, Hamid. Uh, you're, what is your title at Kleiner Perkins? I'm I'm a partner. But aren't you the lead partner? Aren't you in charge? We're, I'm just one of the partners at Kleiner Perkins. Wow, well, you're smiling and being so humble, but I thought they brought you in to run the early stage. Well, we're only one stage, which is early stage. And yeah. so, um, yeah, we're uh, five partners at Kleiner Perkins Got it. Uh, that invest. But you're the and lead partner. Th- there's no such thing as a lead partner no it's just all equal it's all we're all partners and uh, but you set the strategy and hire the team members um i had the good fortune of of having being able to hire some of the partners that are here Got now it. okay and we together are the partners that run kleiner perkins why is it important that partnerships maintain this level of partnership ethos because you're very i know you're in charge but you're very clear to uh, sort of signal that it's a partnership. Why is that important? Why is it so important? Um, partnerships are just very uh, fragile hmm. things. Uh, and uh, uh, I talk about actually how partnerships need to resemble um, a basketball team hmm. and uh, and a partnership that wants to win championships um, or like just like a basketball team that wants to win championships needs to have uh, five partners in the the key roles, you yeah. know, point guard, small shooting guard, power forwards, small yeah. forward, center, yeah, and they're very different roles, right? You, yeah, one person brings the ball up court, one right. person very, dunks it, another person shoots it. There's all different specialities, right? But if you want to win championships, you, you need 
a top one, two, three person each one of the roles. Yeah. Right? Sure. Do you agree? Of course. Yeah. Right. So, and, and in fact, they say today in the league, you need to have at least two all stars, probably three in order to compete. Right. And so I think partnerships need to resemble that mm. venture capital partnerships. Uh, and you also need to have a bench, you know, with a, a sixth person, you know, yeah. maybe a seventh. You need to do well at drafting from college. Yeah. Right. Developing so talent. Every once in a while, you have a Steph Curry that yeah. you recruit from Davidson. Yeah. Right. Uh, but part- Eighth pick in the league. Knicks had the seventh. Right. <laughs> Passed him up. Who was that? I can't remember who we picked at seventh. It, w- it might have been, was it Marcus Camby? It might have been Trevor Ariza. I'm not sure. At the time, yeah. No, Marcus Camby was- a- Marcus Camby was way older. Way, yeah, way maybe older. it was Trevor Ariza. Yeah. Or it was, it, I, don't even, I, I don't even want to look it up because the person is probably no longer playing yeah, in the league. Yeah, they're not. That's, so that's actually- But like- that was a hard decision to make. Steph Curry. I mean, he was like 140 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He developed. He developed. Yeah. So partnerships, uh, why is it important to have, um, I, th- I think it's, one is to have complementary skill sets. So mm. people are different at different things inside of partnerships. Some person might be just like, exceptional at like, forget about just like the sectors they're good at, but even internally operating, like they're really good at marketing PR. Uh, someone else is really good at the, more the operational, mm. like working with, so most partnerships have divide up the roles and responsibilities to help r- run an organization because there is no CEO, right? Mm. There's Most partnerships don't have a CEO. Most partnerships, they do have a CFO, a COO, but they're not typically investors. Yeah. And so, like I said, they're fragile things and they're to keep the balance in the partnerships, you just need to have uh, a group of very complimentary people who want to take on the roles and responsibilities of, of sort of, you know, uh, managing uh, a firm. And speaking of partnerships, you were at U.S. Venture Partnership, which seemed to be kind of like, I don't want to say dorky, but <laughs> kind of like an old school dorky venture firm back in the day. Yeah. It was kind of an old school firm, right? Yeah. I mean, hey, like the average age of a partner, if that tells you something, it was it was higher. Yeah. It was probably in the 50s. You yeah. Know? And uh, I, I learned the craft of venture capital through my partners there. Yeah. So I, I'm severely indebted to all the learnings from there. Yeah. But it was different. It was like, yeah. you know. Old school. It was it's, like it's, a it's 90s a, firm. It was a 90s. It did incredibly well in the semiconductor networking era. Got it. And uh, I think we kind of missed the boat on the internet and software. Uh, and Why would, does a firm like that miss the boat when a new paradigm comes out? Because it's obvious to everybody else, the paradigm is here and it's going to work. Why do they miss it? I'm always confused by that. I think it's a bit of the innov- innovator's dilemma, or it's also a bit the you know if if things aren't broken, like why why fix them or why oh, change? Got it. Uh, and uh, I think also venture, actually, just like professional sports, you have a power alley. Like you have mm-hmm. years, like earning years. You have years where you're really good at it. Yeah. Your your network is really good. The relationships, like your deal flow, your energy, like your energy. All that is good. And then you just like, I kind of made it. Like, I don't need to work as hard. So success is the big uh, deteriorating effect. You become successful and it's like, well, why would I need to chase deals? Totally. Because it's hard work, Jason. You know this. Oh, God. It's this so is hard a work. grind. Yeah. Right. So uh, if you want to do this job, you better show up to mm-hmm. work. All right. And if you've made it and you don't have the inner desire to keep working or, you know, just grinding it. Uh, then retire. You, then you should retire, but most don't, right? And then, yeah. then you become, then you're, because you're senior at your firm, you just l- miss on things. Because like, well, I don't think that's important. Why change? Because right. it's working. What's well, working for you because you're not doing anything. Right. By the way, um, Steph went at number seven. The Knicks actually had number eight. So uh-huh. the Knicks were going to pick Steph. So Ooh. it wasn't as painful as I thought. We were number eight and we picked Jordan Hill, who- I don't think I ever played in the NBA <laughs> at this point. Uh, Slack, when did you meet Stuart Butterfield? Yeah. Uh, I met Stuart for the first time in October of 2013. What was he doing? Uh, uh, he was running- Where were you? He was, I was at Social Capital, yeah. uh, as you know. Uh, and he was uh, running, at the time, a company called Tiny Spec. It was a video uh, game, right? The video game that had- just pivoting into building Slack and they'd built Slack. And at this point they had like six companies that were using it. Um, and it was used by maybe a few hundred people. Mm. And I remember, uh, this is about maybe uh, six to nine months after Yammer had been acquired. 
So, David Sachs' company, David's which company. you were an investor in. I was an investor in on the board of uh, of Yammer. And that to me was the f- an attempt at the social network or the messaging platform for the enterprise. Yammer yeah, it was, was Facebook or Twitter for enterprise. Exactly. It launched at our conference and then got bought by Microsoft, what, year six, five? Actually- For a billion dollars? A billion two. And it was probably three years into Yammer and six years into the company because- Because they had Genie, Genie before that and precisely. they had pivoted. Exactly. What is it about these, these messaging pivots. platforms that they're all based on a pivot? Genie became worth nothing. Yes. Close to nothing. You weren't an investor in Genie. I actually wanted to invest in Genie. That's how I got to know David. Ah. I met David in 06. Yeah. Um, when he's still making a movie. But yeah, we can go talk. Thank you for it. smoking. Yeah. Great movie. Great film. Great, great. Elon has a cameo in it. Yeah. Did you know that? I remember that. Yeah. yeah. He's, one yeah. Of, he's the pilot because David needed a plane- to have the CEO, or whatever the person was flying on. So they put Elon in the front seat as the captain. And he turns around and says, like, welcome aboard or something. Take yeah. your seats. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And that, that's Elon's plane. Yeah, I that. Yeah. <laughs> he loaned him the plane. Yeah, I remember I, we went to, what was it? Uh, Sundance? No, Letterman, you know where uh, Founders Fund is? What's that? Like in the Presidio? Yeah, the Presidio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where he did his screening. David did his screening. Oh, he did his screening there? Yeah. That's hilarious. Uh, and so that's when I first met him around that time. I became infatuated with Genie, the social network for families before right. Facebook was- It was Facebook. like Ancestry and yeah. Yeah, exactly. it was well, a great it was actually, idea. It was supposed to be like the Facebook for everyone else. When that Facebook would work was now, com- if you think about it. Well, yeah. It would work yeah. really good right now. Right now, but you know, again, time, mm. timing- um, Timing is everything. Everything, right? So uh, I was an investor in Yammer um, and had seen that play out. And I thought that was the company that could have been the the messaging platform, the social network, or the network for for mm. companies. And you know, we sold it to Microsoft. So now uh, my mind had moved on to the next thing, and uh, I, I still thought there was an opportunity for a true messaging. So GChat, iMessage, yeah. and uh, you know, Stuart comes along, and he so that we may meet in October of 2013. And at that point, I remember meeting him with my Ted Maidenberg. Yeah. And you know Ted, and he and I are sitting there, and uh, I, uh, I'm like, this is, uh, this is cool, man. But like, go get some more traction. Like, you have like a hundred users or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, we didn't tell him that, but was, I was thinking to myself, good luck, Stuart. Like, you know, and and, and then Ted c- kept following up with Stuart because they were on a board together of another company, Cozy. Cozy, which I'm an investor in. You were an investor in Cozy. Yes, Gino. 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 So Gino is the reason why we know Stuart. Ah. And we love Gino. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, because Stuart invested in Gino. Gino did Cozy. Myself, Gary Vaynerchuk, Kevin Rose. I think Kevin yeah. Rose is So, Ted me. and I, we led the seed round in yeah. Cozy. Yeah. So and that's how set. we know Gino. And Gino and Stuart used to be designers at, uh, at Yahoo together. Ah. And then Stuart joined Gino's board at Cozy. Right. To be a good friend and good, you know, like yeah. help him out. Help him out. Right. And so that's how you we, guys decided. We, and you guys did the Series B? Uh, was it what was it a recap? So it was, how did it go down in October? It could have been a recap, but Stuart was such an awesome guy. He's like, you know what? Like I, I don't. My investors put all this money behind me. I'm not going to recap. He raised them. thirty million or something. At the, at that point, he'd only raised fifteen from Idrisen or somebody. Idrisen and Excel. Got it. Yeah, and right. failed. Yeah, it was not working. The game wasn't working. The game didn't work. That's yeah. also known as failure. You're being yeah. kind, but he yeah. failed again at a game. At a game, it was like his third game. He fails at games and yeah. then builds multi-billion dollar companies. Yeah, even Flickr would Brilliant. be a huge company today if it was still- Oh, that'd be a billion dollar company right? for sure. Huge, right? Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, we, we meet him and we're like, okay, this is great, but like, let's let's keep in touch. And so then like Ted stays on it and he's like, hey man, like you got to check this out. Like, this is your area. You should spend the time on it. And actually, I remember emailing David, at, at, uh, David Sachs. And, yeah. Uh, at the time, he was at Microsoft now. He's like, hey, David, have you heard of this thing called Slack? He's like, no. Won't work. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true competitor. Right? right. Impossible. <laughs> Impossible, right? That's what lifts that about Uber. Yeah. And so then you're like, okay, I should get on this thing. Yeah. So uh, so we actually, uh, we met again. Like in you Jan- guys put what, 10, 20 million in? No, no. We, we put in $25 million in a, the, re- the first round of Slack. Really? For what? 25%? No, no, it was 10, uh, 10%. 10%. It was, it was a, it was the company's going to go public crazy. at 15 billion? Yeah, is what people it's, say. It's a, quiet it's, a period. it's a quiet period. Okay, I, we can't say. You can't talk about. You still on the board or no? No, no, Chimot's no. On, the on the board. Yeah. So if it goes out at ten or fifteen billion, that winds up being one billion to one point five billion return. Did you guys get twenty thirty percent carry on that? It's a two or three hundred million dollar 
payday for the partners. Yeah, it's it's pretty nice. The math works out. Yeah, but you you asked about why Slack at the time. So I think I would say you look at Yammer. Yammer, if it was a just a comparison to draw to, mm. Yammer at the time of acquisition was about um, forget about the number of users, but the users that converted from free mm. to paid was roughly fifteen percent, mm. and the users that were using the product they're about. 7% Dow Mao. So 7% of the monthly active users were also daily active users. Which shows engagement, engagement. How engaging the product is when you divide the Dows into the Maos. Exactly. And then Yammer was charging about a buck eighty per user per month. Slack, on the other hand, the free to paid conversion was about like close to 50% at the time. Hmm. The number of the Dow Mao was about 50%. Wow. And the price per seat per month was like eight dollars. So like multiples on every dimension. Right. Because it was growing like a consumer business, but had the profitability of sort of an enterprise company. Yeah. Like high gross margin. You know, if you look at the S1, it's like, I don't know, it's in the 80s, 90s mm. percent gross margin, which was also the case because, you know, you're, what are your costs to message each other? It's like AWS costs. Did, I want to know how you got over, and maybe it's all these metrics. But how did you get over the fact that there were so many free solutions available and most developer, it was used mostly by developer teams and most developer teams were just using IRC and thought yeah. Slack was silly yeah, and I think, too colorful. I think you couldn't get over, I, we couldn't get over the fact that it was so incessantly being used in the organizations where it was de deployed. So the engagement in the organizations that did adopt it, not the number of organizations that adopted it, was the deciding factor for the investment. Totally. You always look for atomic unit of value. You atomic unit of value. What does it mean? It means that at at the at an n of one. Okay. N it, of one means like one company using it. it. Like figure out what, what's really going on with like the 20, 30 people who are using it. Ah. If it's working, if people are spending eight hours a day inside of Slack or four hours a day, um, and messaging number of messages back and forth, there's something that's like kind of hit. They hit mm. it in that one company. Huh. So now let's take it to ten companies. And if it's working inside of 10 companies in this very similar fashion, I bet you it can scale to 10 million companies. Wow. See, that's a really interesting way to look at it. I've always known that you want to go deep on the engagement with the people who are using it because that is how Snapchat actually raised the money and people decided to make that investment because they looked at it and said, okay, there's not a lot of people using this thing, but the people using it are using it a lot. So it's a, not a lot of users, but a lot of usage. And a lot of usage means a lot of value because people are busy yeah. and have options for their time. 24 hours a day. And if we know, we know we have less time to do less, more things. So, yeah. Many so, options. Many options. It just got me thinking. I was, I've been trying to figure out a way to analyze the inside.com newsletters I've been doing. And I was thinking about the atomic unit as you were speaking. And I just realized there's a group of people who click on, of the 10 links, like the top 10 stories every day, there's a group of people who probably click on greater than five. Mm -hmm. I need to figure out who those people are and then in the database, just treat them differently and kind of understand which writers get the most clicks. Because I bet you there's one writer who gets double the number of clicks on a percentage basis than the bottom writer. Yeah. Which means they're better at selecting stories to be curated, which means the users get more value. Yeah. They and got so, work to do. So yeah, like I think figuring out what that thing is. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Slack, I think they just, so when they launched or even in the beta, is which is when we invested, it was cross-platform. It was iOS. Mm -hmm. It was desktop and browser. Mm -hmm. So you could be anywhere and be like, I have access to Slack. Most companies like, oh, let me launch the iOS app. And then I'll launch the desktop app and you know, and I'll have the browser app, which is okay. Uh, they decided to go with a small team of 10, build cross-platform. Wow. It was amazing. Uh, I remember the the pricing page that was up there, you know, stayed up for like two years. It was like that that team of 10 was incredible. And I think most of them are still there. Uh, and so you have to find like they just hit it with the the product was just well designed. It was fast at the time, and it was still fast, but it was really fast for, for 2013, 14. And uh, it just kind of hit the, it, it, it talked to you. Hmm. It, it really did talk to you. So it wasn't some boring chat product. No, it had personality. It did have personality. Yeah, they had a famous design firm here in San Francisco did the colors and the logo and everything. I forgot the name I, of it. I believe it's, it was, they're actually in Vancouver. Oh, in Vancouver? Yeah. Do you remember the name of that firm? Uh, 
Jackie or Nick, producer Jackie, Emmy Award and producer Jackie, and no Emmy Nick. If you guys could do a quick search, uh, no Emmy Nick. Um, but he may he may be getting an Emmy soon. Vancouver, he wrote a blog post about it. So. He did, he did. Yeah. Who designed, just type who designed Slack? Who did the graphic design Slack? We'll find out when we get back. All right. Uh, after this break, let's just tackle it. Let's go right there. I had Chamath on stage. He took a giant five gallon drum of gasoline, poured it over his head, and lit it on fire. And that went viral. Social capital imploded, and you left to go run Kleiner. I want to know what happened from your perspective. Chamath's been pretty public about his perspective. Let's get yours when we get back on Angel of Podcasts. Scaling sales is so hard. My startups are struggling to build their sales teams and increase the number of leads they get. It's hard to scale sales. We all know that. But you also already know that Salesforce is the world's number one customer relationship management platform which is also known as CRM in the business. And now with Salesforce Essentials, you get an easy out-of-the-box tool and support all at a startup price point. And that's the key here. Salesforce wants to engage startups and they're willing to give you a great price, which I'm about to get to. And the benefits include instant setup and you can easily scale your sales team with just a couple of clicks. You don't need to code and you will get simple integrations that connect and integrate all of your data under one roof You'll have full cycle customer support, so you automatically connect multiple support channels in one place, and you'll be able to automate busy work and repetitive tasks so you're not wasting time and money. Also, your customers can help themselves with a self-service support website. That makes it really easy breezy. Everything you need is on one screen, so you can track emails, calls, and meetings just from your inbox. Super easy. Get access to the world's number one CRM at a cost fit for a startup. So here is your call to action. I want you to go to salesforce.com slash angel and get a 50% discount with an annual contract and get a free onboarding training session. You got nothing to lose and you're gonna get that 50% discount. And really thanks to the Salesforce team for being so generous to the startups who listen to this week in startups and angel, my two podcasts. Go to salesforce.com slash angel and get that 50% discount. All right, welcome back to angel. If you want to uh, subscribe to this podcast, Type the word angel into your favorite podcast player and you will see the hundreds of podcasts about angels, religious angels, archangels. You will not find this podcast. So go to angelpodcast.com and then click on one of the links because there's literally a hundred podcasts by very kind, sweet ladies in the South who are talking about the angels that have intervened in their lives. It's bizarre. I can't find my own podcast. Uh, on these podcasting <laughs> apps. So go to angelpodcast.com. You'll find the link. Um, my guest today is Mamoon from Kleiner Perkins. And he was one of the co-founders and I guess three or four partners who founded yeah, Social Capital. Social Capital along with my friend Ted. Ted and I were on a board together at USVP when you when he was at USVP. So that's what, how Ted- What, what was that? Um, it was the couponing site. Oh, uh, savings.com. Savings.com, yes. Yeah, Lauren. Lauren. Beldman, uh, just great guy. And it was my first board. Yeah. And uh, I was my first time getting equity in somebody's company other than my own. Yeah. And I got, Correct. I think, 25 basis points and I made, or 15 basis points. I think I made $125,000. That's amazing. 15 years ago. And I was like, oh my God, Jade, I showed, I told my wife Jade, I was like, I showed up for nine board meetings over two years. That's 15, almost like $12,000 per board meeting. Yeah. And I show up, I do an hour of prep. I talk to the team afterwards for an hour or two. And it's like a two hour board meeting. It's like five hours. You realize I'm getting paid like $2,000 an hour to be on a board. <laughs> it was a big deal for me. Uh, and it was good because I met Ted and we became friends. Yeah. Um, okay. So social capital launches. You guys are going to do series A's. Yep. I was right there on the front seat. We had a partnership. You guys were an LP in my funds. I was a feeder fund. Obviously, I'm great friends with Ted. You sort of were... We're friends. Yeah, we're friends. We're friends. Yeah, Not totally. great friends. I'm close yeah. friends with Chamath. Totally. Close friends with Ted. You and I are friends. Um, and Chamath, this thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Every year you go drift a little bit further from the Series A investments. Now there's a hedge fund and Chamath's making public stock pitches and he's going to build the biggest and the SPACs and the IPOA. And this thing seems like it's going to the moon and there's, yeah. uh, what, 100, 200 people in the office every day? What did it peak uh, no, at? No, I think we're like 50, 60. Okay, so yeah, it's getting maybe big. Maybe more after I left. It's getting big, and there's a lot of drifting into other yeah. categories of investing. 
And then one day he just decides the whole thing's over and he disappears. What happened from your perspective and how did you manage it? Because the fund was a lot of his money that he made on Facebook. And let's face it, he did start the fund and he recruited yeah. you guys. So yeah. it was kind of his baby. Yeah. What happened from your perspective and what did you learn from it? Yeah. So- Because uh, te- you've never talked about it publicly. I haven't. I have not no. talked about it. No, but um, this is a safe space, so you can yeah, you can tell. Space, just, yeah. just look into that camera and say, "Tremont, how I feel." <laughs> uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, Ted, Ted's, uh, Ted and I used to work together at USVP for a number of years, five, six years uh, overlap, and before we left, and um, Chamath and I, we overlap when he was at Mayfield before he went yes. to Facebook. He did six months at Mayfield, another exactly. old school VC. And so that's how we got to know each other. Right. Chamath and I got to know Trading each other. Trading deals. Yeah. And, and he was cooler than I was. And he still is. Slightly. Uh, yeah. And uh, so Chamath actually approached Ted uh, when he was at USVP. He's like, hey, man, like, you know, they, and they were used to work together at AOL back in the late 90s. Yes, which is where I met them. Right. Because I had, so my company to AOL, when I was going through the revolving door, Chamath was leaving. Yeah. With ICQ and AIM on fire behind him. <laughs> they had put him in charge of it. <laughs> When it was crashing, they were like, yeah, this thing's got 100 million monthly users and it's there's no fuel left and the engines are on fire. Here, you take the controls. He was like, I'm out of (laughs) here. I'm going to go work on this new Facebook thing or become a venture capitalist. Yeah. So he became a venture capitalist and that's how we first met. Yeah. Uh, And uh, I think uh, Chamath always still wanted to be an investor, you Mm -hmm. know, like, and that's, I think that's why after Facebook or while he's at Facebook leaving, he's like, oh yeah, I want to go invest my money. I made a ton, Ton ton of money. Let's go invest it now. And he approached Ted about it. And I think Ted's like, oh, you know, uh, just investing your money would mean that I'd be working for you. Mm. And he's like, why don't we go raise a fund? And like, why don't we try to recruit my my buddy here at USVP, my moon? And so that's how it all kind of came together. Got it. And so um, we raised our first early stage fund and uh, with a focus around education, healthcare, financial services. And we layered on enterprise, which is my area. And then we raised our second fund and a third fund. And uh, that was pretty much all that we had, you know, for many three years. Three funds. Uh, three, and actually Chumath, a fourth fund yeah. and an opportunities fund as well. Chamath was 20, 30% of the funds. Yeah, exactly. So uh, most of the money was not Chamath's. Right, right. Um, but a significant and, portion was. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Like, uh, uh, make no bones about it. Like, the fact that one, one of the partners and the founder of the firm, like, put so much money into a fund and LP's like, okay, you that's a lot of skin in the game. Like, we'll put money in too, right? Yeah, I mean- Skin in the game is the name of the game. Like they expect in a venture fund, the partners collectively to put in low single digits, right? Yeah, totally. So if you have a three hundred million dollar fund, they expect the five partners to put in a half million dollars each or something, or yeah, maybe it's it's like in you know it's it's usually it's low single digits, right? And to hear it's to have like one of the partners putting so much money, like okay, well that's like that's conviction, that's belief. And so I think both of us have known Jamal long enough to know, uh, like there is an immense amount of conviction that he has in himself, and so it was just same thing. And I think still the same thing holds true today. Uh, So, uh, and uh, I think um, you know we we went from an early stage to we launched a a public fund, uh, and then we um, were going to raise a growth fund and. Uh, we then um, around the time I left, we did the SPAC. You know, mm. So there's a, a bunch of stuff, like a bunch of stuff emerged beyond that was beyond venture. And to be honest, like I've, and I've you know Ted knows this, Jamal. I, I love venture capital. Yeah, I love actually. I don't love being called a venture capitalist, but I like lo- love the job of being a venture capitalist. Yeah, an and early stage investor. Totally early stage investor, first partner to amazing founders. Um, I mean, I think the if you just look at the body work from Kleiner Perkins from Genentech to Intuit, Symantec, Sun Microsystem, Netscape, Google, Amazon, you go down the list, first money into those companies, first partner to those founders. And you know what? All those companies changed the the course of like how humans live. Right. True. I mean, like that is, I, yeah. I believe that to be true, even though I have nothing to do with those companies. Uh, and I think I love that about being an early stage investor is that you get to work with these incredible founders and help sort of give them micro advice on a daily, weekly basis and help them fulfill their ambition. And so uh, that's that was what I what gets me out of bed every morning. Mm. And I think uh, we we decided to go do more than just that. Um, and uh, but you asked a question about like what happened. I, I think uh, w- what happened is uh, you know, I think Chamath is kind of the master of his own domain. Yeah. So he's like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. 
And so you want to do something else. Yeah, and that's that's I think we all respect him for that. Actually, yeah, right. So it's you guys are not you guys are on speaking terms. You're friendly. It's not yeah. a disaster. I mean, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, right? But you still get your carry from Slack and all these other great investments. Yeah, I mean that's just like it is, that is what it is. But yeah, like you know, we'll, we'll exchange text messages. Yeah, <laughs> so it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I think hey, like we're. we're Going back to the conversation we started out with, like we're extremely fortunate. Yeah, we're very lucky people. Yeah, and uh, we get to do what we want, mm. and we get to earn great living doing what we love. And the great so- irony of this is Chamath was recruited by John Doerr to maybe merge social capital with Kleiner. That's true. Yeah, that was very out in the public. That didn't happen. Yeah, because Chamath wanted too much control or something. It just couldn't. A deal couldn't get done, from what I understand. And then you wound up taking it over. I think uh, you know my journey with Kleiner was a very long one because of uh, it was like a three year courtship, mm. um, and one is you just don't leave the firm that you you co found right. Yeah. And so to me that was just a hard call together. Like is no, I can't do yeah. that. Can't leave my partners right. and the team that we've built here and the companies. And uh, but over time it became clear that this opportunity at Kleiner was kind of once of a life uh, once of a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. Right to, t- to one of the most venerable institutions in venture capital, maybe in technology, even yeah. to be able to really uh, reboot it. Yeah, um, they kind of lost their way for a little bit. What what happened? Why did they lose their way? They they bet too big on green energy, or they just didn't nurture and draft enough picks in the lottery. If we're using the analogy, when they brought you in, they said, "Hey, here's the mistakes we've made. Here's the things we need you to fix." What were those things? Well, I don't think it was as explicit. Like, oh, okay, like hey. Here are the things that could be improved, yeah. maybe? Uh, I think I came to Kleiner Perkins because I thought we could be number one in what we do. Oh, okay. Right? And so what? what's the action plan? Got it. So that's been the journey that we've been on in the last 18 months is like, how do we get to where Kleiner used to be, right. which was number one for decades? Right. Yeah. I mean, if you were coming to Sand Hill Road, you would meet with Sequoia and Kleiner, yep. like Google did and Facebook and everybody, and you uh, generally would pick one of those or both. And, you, and Google had both. And then it drifted a bit. Yeah. So what happened is, uh, I think uh, when you've solved one set of problems, which is the internet, and done like incredibly well, better than anyone else in the industry, uh, what's the next problem? And in sort of circa 2006, six seven, it was a lot about green tech and mm. uh, sustainability and kind of save the world from itself, from humans that live yeah, on Yeah, John earth. did that famous TED talk where he cried about yeah. what kind of world am I going to leave for my daughter? And that's another type of feature drift, I guess, right. which is you, some people get rich and they call in lazy and rich. Other people get inspired to take on a big, huge challenge and forget where the money was made, maybe. And John wanted to take on and save the planet. But probably in hindsight, he should have done that and kept doing the internet stuff. Yeah, and not just John. I think the partners like Kleiner Perkins ah, should not have them. drifted, right? That's yeah. the thing is like going back to the like the we, we these are partnerships, you know, and not just one person can say what we should do. We should be able to as partners like we're all we're supposedly bright people mm. that are practitioners of understand what technology trends are like, where the great founders are coming from. We should be able to say, you know, we should allocate X percent to sustainability and green, but like the majority of it goes to, you know, Mobile, the the boom in mobile. Yeah, they missed that whole thing. Right, and so uh, you know, to be to be fair, like the 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 returns have still been great. It's just not Kleiner great, right? Right. That's, that's what the, the the bar is so high for for this. Yeah, they have to win championships. Like being in L.A. Right. or Boston or New York. Right. Like the expectation for the Yankees is a championship or nothing. Exactly. Or for the Celtics and the Lakers is like, oh, you got to the playoffs. Who cares? We're here to win championships. Look how many championships we've won before. Um, there was some negativity. I saw some story, and it was a little perplexing to me. I didn't read it um, hmm. because I'm just tired of and exhausted from all the toxicity here in the Valley. But I, I noted it because it had a picture of you and you were friends. And it seemed to be deriding Kleiner, I guess, for the diversity issues in the past, which were a little bit weird because it was the most diverse farm of all of them, right? It was, yeah. Um, and I thought there was some irony here because – or it was confusing to me because you're – not a white dude. I don't know if you've noticed, but you're not a white dude like me. You're a Pakistani immigrant of immigrant parents. My parents don't even live here. They live in Germany. They live in Germany. So you're an immigrant. And I'm Muslim. And Muslim Pakistani who 
is now running one of the most legendary venture firms in the history of the world, one of the top three. Isn't that like a tremendous success for diversity and evolving Silicon Valley? I it's think, a little weird to be criticized, isn't it? Yeah, I think uh, Silicon Valley's definition of diversity is very perplexing. Mm. Uh, it's it's very unidimensional. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you look at like, actually most of the partners at Kleiner Perkins, my partners are, we were not born in this country. Mm. Uh, we, we, you know, have immigrant stories, but that's, you know, that's not diverse in the Silicon Valley yeah. uh, dictionary of uh, diversity. Uh, and uh, I, I think um, there's, uh, and so we actually looked at this. We looked at um, our portfolio of CEOs from our prior fund, Kleiner Perkins 17. We found that 70% of our CEOs were, were foreign born. Wow. Tell me that's not diversity. That's as diverse as it gets, yeah. Yeah. And so, and then talk about diversity when it comes to Kleiner and having hired people from all sorts of backgrounds. I'd say if we use women as diversity, uh, we've hired more women, had more women, women partners, more successful female investors than any other firm in the history of venture capital, maybe even private equity. Yeah. So, uh, so I think we don't get any credit for that. Yeah. Right. And uh, probably should. Uh, yeah, and I, it's not not my work. Like to be honest, yeah. it's like you know this is the work of the the partners at Kleiner Perkins before me. It is interesting when you think about diversity. Um, many of these firms were just six white dudes, so that must have been challenging or perplexing to you coming in. Did you feel like you were wanted or not wanted, as it were, coming in as a non-white male, or do, do you uh, feel you were treated differently? What no, was your never. What was your personal experience? Ne I've never. I've you know what? Like as immigrants, we're also uh, wired to sort of charge forward. We don't mm. really look at like what's holding us back. We just go m run forward. Yeah. And so, um, you, you know, I've, like the victim mentality doesn't set in so much as yeah. an immigrant, I guess. Uh, so uh, there's not much time for it, is there? There is not much time for it. Exactly. Yeah. You're you're, you're running, surviving. You're just trying to get on the boat and try to yeah you know, land. Cross. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Calais, you know. Yeah. Calais to Dover. Yeah. Um, so uh, no. It, I was embraced. The wow. partners at Kleiner Perkins embraced me, yeah. um, and uh, I was, you know, help us, you know, make this what it used to be. Make it great again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hate using that term because it reminds me. I know me of it triggers all this. Like, uh, you, yeah, it tr triggers. It is a hats. bit of a disaster. It's got to be personally frustrating for you as well to watch Trump be in office as a Muslim, and how bigoted he is about this issue. Like you wouldn't have been allowed in the country, right? If it was Yeah, now? I, I would have gotten my student visa probably. And then I once I graduated from college, I probably wouldn't have gotten a visa to stay here for a job. Hmm. So I'd probably be back in Germany, working at Deutsche Bank or Siemens, you know, in, yeah. in middle You'd be management. You'd an executive middle VP, management. EVP. M maybe lower. V lower. SVP. Lower, lower, lower. VP. Yeah, maybe like Director. That. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Associate director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy um, to think that. And you know, the the particularly troubling, and I'm not an expert on it, but you are, uh, I think, because you're in the community. It's perplexing because you do have radicalism. Yeah. And then you have people who are assimilating while, you know, respecting tradition, but being part of these other cultures. And America is supposed to be a, a melting pot. Um, and I think maybe a, if you say melting pot today, people would take offense to that. I don't know. What, what when we when I grew up, they they yeah. told us this is what made America great was yeah. that we were a melting pot, and now we have the xenophobia. Yeah. And you know, to not accept the most progressive of the Muslim community is the biggest problem because you know the most progressive members of the community are the ones who are derided the most by the radicals. Like yeah. the fact that you work in the West is not appreciated by them. Yeah, I think um, as Muslims in America, I think we just need to do better yeah. as um, at assimilating, you know, uh, police officers, firemen, you know, uh, professors, lawyers, civil rights lawyers, uh, supporting those, who, the homeless that are down the block from you here, yeah. you know. Um, and I think it's just doing more than the average American. And uh, because it's- Setting the bar higher. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just like you know, and so uh, if you if you go to a mosque on a Friday prayer, that's when you have a, a sermon. Where the the imam gets up and says, you know, 
And a lot of times the, the it's about, hey, just be better Americans. Mm. Like don't play victims here. Like go be better. Like yeah. use your religion to guide you to be better human beings and help people. Go public service, public office. Yeah. And that's why I think you're seeing people like uh, Ilan Omar in Congress and yeah. other Muslim women in Congress now and men. Uh, it's because people, it's kind of starting to hit. Like you become a real contributor to this society, your, um, your country. And I think uh, I have hope. I yeah. think this is, has actually been a catalyst for a lot of people to, to actually own it and be better. It's it's fascinating because I I have been watching Elon Iman Ilhan Omar Ilhan Omar I've been watching her and I've been trying to give her the benefit of the doubt because uh, it's great to see the diversity in Congress she's Congress right yeah, yeah. and you know then there's like a little bit of anti-Semitic thing maybe uh, yeah but I never thought about it from the perspective you just shared with me which I appreciate which is I didn't realize there was a movement inside of the culture to say, hey, let's assimilate, let's be great Americans, let's participate yeah. and bridge that gap. Because it feels like the gap is sometimes insurmountable yeah. at times. And it's not. It's not. I mean, you have a woman wearing a hijab in Congress now. Yeah. And you have like probably six other Muslims who are in Congress. Well, that's like, just shows that America doesn't care what your color is, what the what kind of headscarf you wear and yeah. where you come from. They just want people who serve the country. Yeah, right. who believe in this country, right? Yeah. And who believe in the, goodness, the ideals. The, the ideals, the, and that's why I'm here. I mean, I, I, I've been in Silicon Valley for, what, 22 years now? And yeah. I love Silicon Valley for, what the, for the ideals of what it stands for. What do you think about the soft bank issues around taking money from Saudi Arabia? Mm -hmm. This is kind of intense. I've been pretty vocal that we should yeah. pause it. What do you think about my stance? What's your stance? <sighs> yeah, I think it's... Um, uh, Saudi Arabia and the government there is pretty troubling. Yeah. Very troubling. And so it's it's tough to uh justify taking large sums of dollars, 45 billion dollars yeah. from that government and deploying that across, you know, growth engines of our economy. Right. And uh feeling good about that as yeah. founders, CEOs, investors, um, investors, right? It's um yeah, it's it's just all around. Like it doesn't feel good. It doesn't no. feel right. And so uh, that's how I feel about it. So uh, you personally feel. That's how I personally. How feel. How does the firm feel? And then how do your founders feel? So because these LP, I mean, we're talking about one of the largest potential LPs in the world. Yeah. And they want to invest, and now they've sort of blown it. It's so weird. I don't know if you saw those photos or my tweets about it. Like MBS comes to the country, tells everybody this is going to be the big change. And then he goes and kills Khashoggi in cold blood, and then, or his his people do, uh, yeah. and I guess he's denying it. And then we just had thirty seven um, public beheadings last week. Mm -hmm. uh, how do founders feel about it here? Do are founders cognizant of it and saying like, do you have them as an LP, or what should I do if they offer me money? I'm I, I'm getting it from my founders. I think founders are cognizant of it yeah. but i think at the end of the day when you have a term sheet on the table you you, you forget about those things that matter yeah uh, but you're absolutely right these are trouble like, this is not this is not normal this should not exist in the world as it stands today yeah uh this is uh you know we should stand up for it we should we're better for it yeah especially if we're in silicon valley where we you know we're supposed to be the not the moral high ground of the world, but- We should so, have the moral high ground, actually. Yeah, I think we, we, we should. should, right? We should aspire to, at so, least. I mean, we created the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Eleanor Roosevelt created it with yeah. the UN. She led that charge. We should be the champions of human rights. So, of yeah, course. I mean, I think my firm feels the way I feel about yeah. it. And, um, but it, it is, I, I had hope, you know, for- Me too. MBS, I did. He came out here, did his thing and- Shook everybody's uh, hands, said the right yeah, things. Women are driving now. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It gets crazy. Women can drive. 20, 2019 and women are driving now. Uh, I, I had hope. They and pitched him as a reformer and I was maybe going to meet with him yeah. and that didn't wind up happening. Uh, but then I see all this stuff and I worked at Amnesty and I was just thinking, you know, we're not perfect here in this country, but this dialogue needs to occur. Yeah. And I'm in a position where at least some number of people will consider it if I say it. That may not change somebody's opinion, might not change when the term sheet's in front of them, but at least they'll think for a moment. And it really should challenge us as well because I was reading that China has a million um, Muslims. Actually more. It has- Two uh, million now, is that what they no, say? No, 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 It's actually more like 
I believe it's more like 50 million, like 50 to 100 million in in Western China. Are in a re-education camp is what they call it. It's a concentration camp or it's a lockdown city, somewhere between those two. Yeah. And and this is where I think it's very important for us to lead the charge. If we have 3 million people incarcerated in this country or something in that effect, and a million of them shouldn't be in there because it's for nonviolent, you know, cannabis crimes or something. And then we have the death penalty here. And then Bush thought and this idiot in the office right now thinks it's okay to waterboard people and it's not torture. If Trump thinks waterboarding is not torture, I invite him to try it. Because I think he'll quickly find that simulated drowning is the same as drowning. Like we can't be torturing people as part of our foreign policy or our military and we cannot be keeping people incarcerated who don't deserve to be there. If we want to go to MBS or China and say, hey, you guys should reconsider. If you want to do business with us, we need you to just step up the human rights. Just try to meet us halfway and let's at least steer the world towards you know, some base level of human rights, right? Yeah. As yeah. opposed to devolving it. Yeah. So uh, in a way, the world is great today, but at the same time, we have um, big powers with big sorts of weapons, whether it's cyber weapons or yeah. physical weapons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we all sort of feel on edge today. It is a little anxiety producing. It's yeah. it's all trending in the right direction. I, I think the the field we play on, capitalism, is the new um, battleground. Because if you think about it, we're, we're not blowing each other up as much as we used to in having world wars. But suddenly Saudi Arabia wants to participate in capitalism at the highest level. So where do they go? Silicon Valley. Yeah. China wants to participate on the highest level. Where do they go? Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. And capitalism. And so in China, they're going to try to beat us on a, on capitalism. They want us using TikTok. Yep. TikTok's a Chinese company. Mm-hmm. TikTok is obviously a spying app for the Chinese government. I mean, if you don't think that they have all that data, they now have ever they have the microphones and cameras of 50 million Americans. They can spy on all of America just like Huawei can. Like we have to open up our eyes to this possibility that human rights and like Capitalism needs to work at a high-functioning level for democracy to work at a high level. Yeah. Well, a lot's at stake, Jason. Uh, yeah. y- you know, the number one superpower is at stake over the next five years. Yeah. It will either flip-flop yeah. or will stay, yeah. you know, be the 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 policeman for yeah. the world yeah. or it may become China. Yeah. Well, I mean- What would you rather like? If we want people to live under- imperfect democracies, we better hope for America. And if we want them to live under perfect authoritarian dictatorships, then pick pick your poison. Mm-hmm. Yeah. China, Saudi Arabia, Russia. I mean, they, they've perfected the art of being a, you know, a dictatorship. All right. Thank you for joining us for this week in dictatorships. <laughs> I guess we went deep. Huh? We went deep. We went on a couple of tangents, but I think important ones. And listen, I, I just want to tell you, uh, Continued success. I'm very proud of uh, the fact that you took that top slot at Kleiner, even though you deny that you're in the top slot, because you're hardworking and your 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 heart's in the right place. And I wish you great success with it. The world needs more people like you, Mamoon. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. We'll see you all next time on Angel the Podcast. Boom. <laughs>